Good morning. <laughs> that ended a little quicker than I thought. And that's funny because I'm the one that makes those things. Hey, I want to let you know before we get into this morning's message, uh, two, let's see, two Saturdays from yesterday, Saturday, August 14th at 630. We're going to have a movie night here at FCC. We do those occasionally, and they're always a fun time. Uh, this year, we're going to be showing the film What If, and we're going to have popcorn, candy, and drinks. Who doesn't like that? And uh, certainly a whole lot cheaper than to go to the low Cineplex or something like that. So we hope that you'll uh, make plans if you're free that night to join us. It'll be a fun night to have the body of Christ together. Also, if you're visiting with us today, welcome to First Christian Church. If you've yet to fill out one of our connection cards, which basically means I probably don't know your name, and I would love to know your name and even be able to remember your name. And so you can help us do that by filling out one of the connection cards. They're located in the pew rack in front of you. Or if you're tech technical enough and you have a smartphone, you want to zap the uh, QR code at the top of that. That'll take you right to an online uh, connection card. You know, most of us hate tests. You remember back to your high school days uh, preparing for the SAT or the ACT, and if you can't remember back that far, maybe you remember back far enough when your kids uh, took the ACT or the SAT test. Now, when I was in high school, I was actually pretty good at math. And in ninth grade, I got a 98 on the final exam that tested us for the entire year's material. And that was in algebra. Well, came 10th grade, and now we're doing geometry. And this year, I got a 99 on the geometry final. Well, 11th grade was trigonometry, a little bit harder. But I was determined. I went from a 98 to a 99. I was getting my 100 this year, but I got another 99. Well, halfway through my senior year of high school, 12th grade, at least at that time, was calculus. But halfway through my senior year of high school, I decided I was going to attend a Bible college. And I was probably likely to go into ministry. I didn't know what I could use calculus for in ministry, so I dropped math halfway through my senior year, ending my quest for a perfect score on a math final. Well, in our journey through Genesis, we've been traveling with Abraham and his wife, Sarah, for the past two weeks. And God has wonderfully fulfilled his promise to Abraham and Sarah by providing a child for them named Isaac. But now Abraham was, must once again put his faith and trust in God completely as he is given a very difficult command. Several years after Isaac was born, God once again speaks to Abraham. But this time, he doesn't come with promises. Instead, he tells Abraham to do something that Abraham cannot understand. Why God would tell him to do this thing. God instructs Abraham to offer up his beloved son Isaac as a sacrifice. As a human sacrifice. You understand what that means. After 25 years of waiting for a son and another 15 or so years raising and loving that son, God instructs Abraham to kill Isaac. And you know, this story is perhaps the most confusing, disturbing, and complex story found in the entire Bible. From the very first verse of this account, the Bible makes it clear that this is just a test. But Abraham didn't know that. All he knows is what God is telling him to do. Let's read. Chapter 22 is where we're going to spend most of our time. We're going to read the first two verses right now. Now, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Okay, we're going on a camping trip, right? Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. What in the world is God doing here? Why in the world would God issue 
a command like this? Why does God test us? Well, you know, you're going to experience in your life multiple times when God will test you through certain circumstances or situations. And one of the reasons God does this is to reveal to us our spiritual progress and, and perhaps reveal and highlight areas that we need further development in. When we would take a, class, a, a test in school, the teacher is testing the students to see how much they are comprehending. But they're also looking to determine what areas that that child, that student needs further development and needs to work on further. And so the test is a measuring device to determine how well a student is learning and also to reveal how uh, much the student needs to continue to learn and in what particular areas. And you know what? God's tests are much the same way. Maybe you're going through a time right now that you can say, well, I'm going through a test, no doubt about it. And God's tests are measuring devices to reveal to us how much we are actually allowing his truth to transform us into the likeness of Jesus. And listen, if you never went through difficult challenges and difficult times, how would you know for sure that your faith is mature and that you are living in the likeness of Jesus. It's relatively easy to live in the likeness of Jesus when things are going fairly well. But what about those times when things aren't going so well? And see, the purpose of these tests are to reveal to us the progress of our growth, but also areas in our lives that we need to focus on and we need to develop better. There's a second reason God tests us, and that is to prepare us for greater blessings. To prepare us for greater blessings. Now, greater blessings should not be equated with financial blessings. We Americans tend to do that. We kind of equate blessings and material success as one and the same. The blessings of God are so much more meaningful than materialistic growth. Now, as with Abraham, God wants to bless us. But as a good father, he knows that some of the things we consider to be blessings aren't really blessings. These are things that could, could crush us. These are things that could do more harm than good if we're not ready for them. And so God tests us to make sure we are ready and prepared to receive his blessings. Now, we can only imagine what Abraham must have been feeling and thinking when God issues this command to go and sacrifice his son. I mean, this is the son that God gave to him miraculously. This is the son whose descendants will be made into a great nation to be as numerous as the stars are in the sky. Now, Isaac didn't have any children yet. It's kind of important here, stick with me, it's kind of important here that he stays alive in order to have descendants. I mean, how could God ask Abraham to do something like this? Yet for Abraham, he has heard the voice of God before, and it's unmistakable. This is God telling him to do this. And Abraham might have said, but God, how are you going to fulfill the promise that my descendants are going to fill this land? They're going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the, and the sand on the seashore. God, do you know how this works? Why would you be asking me to do this? And you know, whenever we find ourselves in a difficult spot, in a time in life that maybe is not easy, in a season where we don't want to be in this season right now, the first question we almost always ask is why? Why, God, would you allow this in my life? Why, God, are you asking me to do this or endure this? This doesn't fit into my plan, God, why? And then you got the other matter at hand. How is he going to explain all of this to Sarah? He must thought to himself, what's she going to say? When I come back from the mountain without Isaac, and she asks me where he is, what am I going to tell her? 
that I killed our son? She's never going to believe me if I tell her that God told me to do so. She'll have me arrested. She'll have me committed to a psych ward. So I, uh, Abraham had to have a really, really sleepless, troubled night of torture and of heartbreak after God gives him this command. Now in this test, we see several questions that Abraham must wrestle with. And, and these are questions that you and I have to wrestle with and have to answer in our lives. And the first question is what we call the love question. That is, who or what occupies that highest place in your life? Because who or what you love will by default occupy the highest place in your life. So God tells Abraham, Abraham, take your son. And then, and then God kind of digs a little deeper. Your only son. Then he goes a little further. Whom you love. And God's not making this easy. Abraham, take your only son whom you love and go. And sacrifice him. Man, Abraham loved his son Isaac. But the question is, does he love God more? And this is a unique situation. God would never ask you or I to sacrifice our child but for abraham to be the father of all nations for god to be able to bring forth a, an entire nation of people from his descendants there had to be absolutely no question at all about who would be first place in abraham's life and abraham's heart who did abraham really love the most and I think to some lesser degree, you and I have had experiences like this. Perhaps you have or are presently staring at some situation, some circumstance in your life, and you're like, is this really what God wants me to go through? Is this what God is asking me to endure? Is this really God's will? And you cry out, why? Why is this happening to me, God? Why would you want me to do this or endure this? And you know what? That's life's toughest question. It's not so difficult when we can see a reason. However, when something happens to us in which we fail at that time and at that moment to see any logic or reason, and in fact everything seems to be against the logic, this is when our faith is really put to the test. Who or what really has first place in our heart and in our life. It's going to be truly revealed in these difficult times. And so we face this same question. Who or what occupies the highest place in your heart and your mind? Is it God? Or is it someone or something else? Maybe it's yourself. You just love yourself more than you love God. Or maybe it's the pursuit of pleasure or money or reputation or power, or it's another person. Maybe it's your kids. You know what? Jesus set this really high standard for being his follower. In comparison with everything else, Jesus taught us that God must occupy the highest position in our hearts so that all others are a distant second. Did you hear this week came out of the Olympics in Tokyo? There was this Dutch cyclist. She crossed the finish line in this particular race, and she held her hands up in victory. She was ecstatic that she had won the race. Only thing is, she didn't win the race. She came in second place. The cyclist that won the race was so far out ahead of her and had beat the pack by so much, everybody lost sight of her. And this lady had crossed the finish line several minutes before this woman did. And she was shocked when she realized that she indeed had not won the race. She had come in second place. And you know, God, he has to be so far out ahead of everything else in our life. That's what he requires. 
Jesus said this in Luke chapter 14. He said, listen, if you want to be my follower, you want to be my disciple, you must love everyone else. Your father and your mother and your wife and your children, your brothers and your sisters, yes, even your own life. You must love everything else less than you love me. A lot less than you love me. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. You know, Jesus spoke those words. I've kind of modified it and used this phrase, less than you love me. Jesus used the word hate. That, that kind of indicates to you that, that wide margin between first and second. That Jesus would measure that margin so wide as to use the word hate. I kind of just soften it because I don't want people to think like, wow, Jesus tells me to hate my mother. Now Jesus tells you to love your mother a whole lot less than you love him and everything else in your life. So Abraham has to answer this love question because who or whatever I love most is going to have first place in my life and in my heart. Second question that Abraham must wrestle with and you and I have to wrestle with as well is the obedience question. Will you obey God even when you don't understand his will? Even when you don't understand why he would tell you to do something when the command is so difficult. Now to us, this request that God made of Abraham makes no sense. Didn't make sense to Abraham either. But here's the deal. It didn't have to make sense for Abraham because Abraham was going to obey God. Abraham chose to trust God. Genesis chapter 22, verse 3, it says, The next morning Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and he took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac. And he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering. And he set out for the place that God had told him about. Now notice here, Abraham responds quickly. It says, early the next morning. Now you look back to the, to the directions God gave him, and God didn't say you have to go tomorrow. In fact, God didn't really tell him when he had to go. Told him you have to do this thing, but didn't tell him when. But you know, Abraham, I think, understood something that you and I would do well to understand. The quicker you obey God, the more likely you are to obey God. So again, the quicker you obey God, the more likely you are to obey God. And vice versa, the longer you wonder about it, the more you think about it, the more you ponder about it, the more you say, well, I got to pray about it, the more you say, I got to go and I think about this, you know, I got to do whatever. There are certain things in life, yes, that take a lot of thinking. And even Jesus spent a lot of time in prayer before he made decisions. But when God tells you to do something and you read clearly, the Spirit nudges you, the Holy Spirit says to you, through the word, through a message, through a lesson, however God speaks to you, and you know it's clearly the voice of God, the quicker you obey that, the more likely you are to obey it. And so Abraham's obedience is prompt and it's complete. And his heart is torn, but yet he gets up early the next morning. And he goes, just as God instructed him to. You know what? God is not at all impressed by our emotional displays toward him. He's impressed by our obedience. You know, we can come together in a setting like this and we can raise our arms in worship. And, and, and trust me, I believe that's a beautiful thing when the heart is right and when the week has been right and we don't have sins on our calendar. And so I have nothing, no, nothing against raising our arms in worship. But here's the problem. We could believe that our emotions will kind of melt the heart of God in such a way that he'll be like, wow, good job. I mean, we can walk around all day long, say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And we could post scripture verses on our social media pages every single morning. But none of these matter if we don't love God enough to obey him completely, even in the most difficult commands we don't understand. And so I'm impressed with Abraham's obedience here. When he God tell him to go and offer his son as an offering. Abraham obeys and he goes right away. Sort of like what Paul told the Colossian church when he said, and now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, 
You must continue to live in obedience to him. Obedience is not an option. You got to live in obedience. And obedience means obeying completely and obeying immediately. Obedience has to be complete because you can't just decide, I'm going to obey God here in this matter, but I'm not going to obey God in this matter. I will do this according to what God says, but I won't do that. Because that's not obedience. Obedience is, is the direction of your life. It is what your life is about. It's not just isolated incidences and commands that you get to choose what you want to do and what you don't want to do. You can't decide, hey, I'm going to obey God here and not there. And you got to obey God immediately. Because obedience is not obedience when it's delayed. It's only obedience if you respond when you're told to. It's not obedience when you obey only when you feel you're ready to obey. I mean, do we tolerate if we say to our child, listen, you need to set the table. And the child says, well, when I feel like it. I would say to my kid, you know what, I feel like swatting you on the behind right now. <laughs> listen, perhaps God is asking you to, to take some step of obedience outside of your comfort zone. Perhaps God is asking you to, to do something in a way that's going to make you uncomfortable and is going to bring a lot of uncertainty in your life. Maybe obeying God today for you means trusting God in the area of your finances. Maybe you've never tithed and given 10% back to God like he directs us to in his word. And the step that God wants you to take is to do that for the very first time and to trust him and honor him in the area of your finances. Or maybe obeying God today for you means finally inviting that friend of yours or that family member of yours to church. Or maybe just sharing your faith with that person for the very first time. I mean, you know God has put this person on your heart. God is wanting you to reach out to this person. God is wanting you to let this person know you're a Christian and invite him to church, but you haven't taken that step of obedience yet for different reasons. Maybe God today is just telling you, you got to go. Or maybe obeying God today for you means giving up some sin in your life that you have refused to let go of up till this time. I mean, you know it is wrong, and you know you should let go of it. But you haven't taken that step of obedience yet. Or maybe God, obeying God today for you just means ending some unhealthy relationship that you're in. I mean, you know that the relationship is not good for you, but you're holding on to it for security reasons. And you don't want to be lonely. And maybe God is telling you to step outside of your comfort zone and let go of that relationship. Or maybe God is saying to you, stay in this relationship. You're married and you made a vow before me. And you can't just walk away from this relationship, this marriage. See, Abraham didn't delay. Abraham didn't ponder. He didn't doubt. He didn't wonder what he would do. As he had done for the past 45 years, when God said go, Abraham got up and he went. And so you have to answer that obedience question. Will you obey even when you don't understand it or it seems difficult? Third question is the worship question. The worship question. And this is, will you offer to God your very best? Will you offer to God your very best? Look at verse 9 in our uh, reading today. When they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abraham built an altar, and he arranged wood on it. And then he tied his son Isaac. He laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham, I mean, picked up a knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. And Abraham was going to worship. He was there to worship. That's what you did before the altar of God. And that meant offering the God, offering God the very best he had, whatever God asked for, even if it was his only son. But God would never ask us to do that. Again, this situation is very isolated. But the principle remains the same. Do you offer God your very best? I mean, if you serve in a ministry here, 
Do you offer God your best effort in this ministry? For example, if, if perhaps you teach, teach a Sunday school class, maybe you teach little ones on Wednesdays or, you, you know, whatever. Do you take time to really plan your lessons out and make your teaching relevant to whatever age it is that you teach? Do you just slap together a lesson on Saturday because you've got to get it done? If you serve on our greeting and host team, do you arrive on time? Do you smile? Do you offer your help to people? Do you get to know those unfamiliar faces? If you serve as a leader in our church, do you lead well? Do you lead with integrity? Do you do the best you can do? If you serve on our worship team or in our audio video ministry, do you practice on your own? Do you arrive on time for rehearsals? Do you lead with enthusiasm? In whatever area you serve, do you bathe that effort in prayer? Do you ask God to be with you and give you humility and confidence and power as you serve? Do you give the best you've got to God? I want you to think back to the story of Cain and Abel near the beginning of Genesis. You know that Cain eventually murdered his brother Abel. Do you know what began their riff? Well, in Genesis chapter 4, we read this. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. Nothing wrong with that. Two noble careers. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. And the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Now, Cain made an offering, and aren't we supposed to just give what we can give, and God will be happy with that? Well, Cain gave some of his crops, it wasn't the best of his crops. It wasn't all of the crops. It was some. And here's the deal. In Cain's mind, some is just fine. And folks, some is rarely just fine. You give some of your effort, you give some of your money, you give some of your attention, you give some of your day, and in your mind, you're doing great. But with God, some is rarely fine. But his brother Abel brought the best portions of the firstborn lambs as an offering. Abel gave the best of the best to God. Well, Cain gave some of what he had, and that was the seed of anger and resentment in Cain that led him to murder his brother. Listen, folks, worship is giving the best of what you have and what you are to God, no less. I had a professor in seminary, Dr. Joe Ellis, and I remember a few things the man taught me, but I remember this one the most. Holy shoddy is still shoddy. He said, guys, if you're going to be in ministry, you got to give the best and never accept less than the best from yourself, because holy shoddy is still shoddy. And so we have to answer that worship question. Will we give the best of who we are to God? And then there's the final question, the faith question, and that is, will you trust God with your future? Will you trust God with your future? Now, I want you to notice a couple of different aspects of Abraham's confidence in God as he goes along through the story. First is this, Abraham, when he gets these directions, right, he tells his servants, and, and he says to his servants, he, he saddles a donkey, he takes the servants with him along with his son Isaac, and, and, and then he says to them, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will travel a little farther, and we will worship there, and then we will come right back. What was Abraham believing was going to happen when he got up onto that mountain? that he could say boldly, well, we'll be back, both of us. I mean, Abraham clearly understood this command. Yet he still trusts God so much that he expresses confidence that God is somehow going to pull this thing off and that he would return with Isaac alive and intact. 
See, Abraham trusted God would do what he himself could not see how God could do. That's why you never want to put a limit on what God can do in your life. Just because you can't see it, you don't understand it, you don't get it. That doesn't mean God can't. Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac at the altar. That meant killing him. But he knew he would still return somehow with Isaac after they worshipped. And then there's another example I want to show you here. When Isaac inquires where the lamb for the sacrifice is going to come from. I mean, Isaac was old enough to know you need a sacrifice if you're going to make a sacrifice. And Abraham's response to to his son's question in verse 8 is really a prophetic look into the future of what God would provide on Mount Calvary some 2,000 years in the future. Abraham declares, verse 28, God himself is going to provide the lamb, my son. God's going to provide. He didn't know how, but he was confident God would. And I think there had to be a quiver in his voice, and his hands must have been shaking, and there must have been a big gulp as he said this. Because they were now on the mountain. The altar had been bought, built. The fire had been constructed, and it was going. And God had not provided that animal for the sacrifice yet. And was getting down to the wire. It was put up or shut up time. So let's pick the story back up at verse 10. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know. You truly fear God. Abraham, you've passed the test. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. And then Abraham looked up and he saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named the place Yahweh Yireh, which means the Lord will provide. And to this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. My friends, do you have a faith that's so big that you can trust God A faith where you can put your confidence in God, that he sees your needs and he will provide for your needs. Maybe not until the last moment. Maybe not so far ahead that could make you comfortable, but enough to know that God will come through. I mean, even if Abraham would have carried this bloody act through to its end, he was confident God would then raise his son from the dead because he was walking off that mountain with his kid. God had promised, therefore it would be. And sometimes the journey to where God wants to take us can be one of a lot of confusion and a lot of pain. But let me show you where God wants to take you because it's where God wants to take all of us. And it's at the end of verse 12. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Folks, that is where God wants to take every single one of us. He wants to take us to a place where we no longer withhold anything from him. Anything. And once God knew Abraham had passed the test, God intervened and he stops the sacrifice. And this is the place God wants to take you to. A place in our relationship with him where we withhold nothing from him. So let me ask you this question. What has God given to you that you need to walk up that mountain and you need to say, God, it's yours. Here it is. I'm giving it to you, God. My life, my marriage, my finances, my career, my home, my, my car, my being, my children. Here it is, God. I need to give this to you. I need to bring this before you, and I have to stop withholding anything from you. You know, it's really interesting in that the very thing 
that Abraham told Isaac would happen? Back in verse 8, Abraham tells Isaac, Isaac, the Lord's going to provide the sacrifice. And in verse 13, the Lord provides the sacrifice. And so Abraham, he takes this ram. I love this. He sacrificed it in the place of his son. In the place of, instead of, as a substitute for. In just a few moments, we're going to partake of communion. We're going to pause the message and we're going to take of communion together because it just fits right here. And obviously, the references to Jesus is all over the place in this story. That Jesus was the lamb that was substituted for us. Jesus was the sacrifice that God provided to die in our place. Jesus it's the one who dies instead of you or me. God provided the sacrifice. And to help us to remember and never forget this, this central pinnacle truth of his word. One day Jesus was having supper with the disciples. They were sharing the Passover meal. And Jesus picked up some bread, which was not unusual during a Passover meal for the leader to explain what each item meant. And so he picked up the bread, but he puts a new twist on it. He takes the bread and he breaks the bread and he passes it to his disciples and he says, take and eat. Up to this point, that's normal Passover stuff. Take and eat. And then Jesus puts a twist on it. For this is now my body. And this now represents what I am going to give up for you. What is going to be substituted and sacrificed in your place. And after supper, Jesus, he takes the juice and, and, and he pours it out into a cup. Not unusual for Passover. This is what they did. And even passing it around for everybody to drink, not unusual. That's what they did. But Jesus puts a different twist on it. And he says, see this cup? From now on, this cup is going to represent my blood, which is going to be poured out for you instead of your blood. It's going to be my blood in place of, as a substitute for. And so every time that you do this Passover thing, I want you to remember what I have done for you. And so we're going to take just a few moments now for each of us to just bow your head where you are, think about what God has provided for you, and then together we're going to partake of the emblems of communion. Let's bow and pray together.